Hello everybody, this is Green again. Hey man, today I feel like expressing my views on the topic that I know everyone is going to love and just rejoice over and just gather around a campfire and hug that girl that says big hugs who's got giant titties. Alright. No. Religion. So, it's kind of impossible to talk about this without at least talking in some degree about my views on religion and, say, faith. Because, you know, it took me a while to realize they are two different things. But, I'm not a Christian. I've never going to claim to be a Christian to make anybody happy. But I did learn a four-letter word a long time ago. And that four-letter word is called TACT, T-A-C-T. And in layman's terms, it just means how you approach a topic. But anyway, religion. I don't have a problem with people who have a particular faith or religion or personal creed. I think, moreover, the issues are your specific doctrine in some cases, and proselyting. We'll, we'll approach proselyting first. I myself, again, I don't, I don't find, say, Christians for specific examples. Those are some of the most common ones. All right. I don't mind people who want to express their views on their faith. But I think, especially after my observations of other people's issues with Christianity, Christianity, I think, oh gosh, now I'm sure I just keep getting people's names confused. I think it was Hitchens. Hitchens? Yeah, Hitchens. Okay, Mr. Hitchens. Uh, not Dawkins, he's a scientist guy. Hitchens said it best, is I don't understand what you believe in, I just don't want to hear about it, you know, and I think the main sentiment there is still, he doesn't want to hear about it all the damn time, all right, for example, somebody runs up to you and says, oh, did you know that Jesus is our Lord and Savior, he gave his life 2,000 years ago so he might live eternally? That's proselyte. That's sharing your faith with another person. The problem is this isn't proselyting. You're not sharing anything. You're running up with a hammer and beating somebody over the head with it. And this approach, the reason this problem is not what you're sharing, it's how you're sharing it. It's the idea that you project that you're not giving occasion to any kind of response. You're not engaging in dialogue with the intended recipient. Therefore, you're just throwing a talking point at them and expecting them to agree with you. Hey, well, no, that's not even, that's not true at all. You're expecting nothing, actually. Because when you fire something like that at someone, there's not really any real response. Because you say, oh, yeah, that's awesome. That's pacified. All right. Or, man, get the fuck out of my face. That's resistance. All right. Neither one of these is a good response. All right. So, proselyting. I don't have a problem with proselyting. If somebody come up and talk to me and I'm like, you know... I've always been curious about Christianity. Would you mind telling me about Christianity? And I've been known to do this from time to time. But the secret here is I'm not really so much interested in Christianity itself. I want to know what that person thinks Christianity is. And I think, in my perspective, this gets actually closer to the heart of the matter because religion, faith, religion is group thing. Faith is a personal 
Faith is a personal quest. Sorry, folks. See, it seemed like I was distracted. I thought I saw a gigantic turkey. Anyway, faith is a personal quest. And so if I ask you what Christianity is to you, I want to hear what you think Christianity is. But that's my point. Proselyte is not really such a bad thing. It's just how people go about doing it. And I get it. Some of y'all really new to the faith and you feel like you've discovered this long lost knowledge that's been denied to mankind unless you read this, this book that some like 48 people wrote. I'm vaguely familiar with the Bible. I'm vaguely familiar with quite a few things in it. In fact, I would argue to say that I've read more of the Bible than most of the people who claim to have read it. And I haven't even studied it. There was a... There was a research poll done about Christians, and people who claim to be Christian. And how many of them professed to know what was in the Bible, but have never read it. And it's something like over 70% of Christians. That to me is just terrifying. Because that means that basically your faith is up for grabs. Whatever you think is right from moment to moment is what has to be true. And this is only one step removed from ideology. The ideology that you will follow my faith or I'll smite you in the name of my Lord. I'm a live and let live kind of person. I don't really care what you believe in as long as it doesn't infringe upon my rights and my ability to live in the best way I believe in. But... That's proselyte. Now we'll go back to faith. A huge issue I have with faith and religion in general. So someone once said, and I think you adequately, and I think it was in a discussion with Christopher Hitchens, with, with Hitchens. I can't remember. Anyway, as I said before, I'm trying not to associate myself with other people simply to piggyback off their fame. It's more just to make certain points. And I'm doing this to say, yes, I'm comparing my argument to their argument. But a person once said that Christianity itself is not directly responsible for the things that some people who claim they're Christians do. Unfortunately, I believe that is a fairly erroneous statement. And here's why. Christians in the past have been known to go to war over the trivial, most insignificant slights. They have been known to erase towns from existence over the idea that they were infidels and they believed in someone that was not their God. Or they followed a faith or a path in life they didn't agree with. But there are very few examples uh, maybe that's not the best way to start that statement. It's not all that common for Christians to correct other Christians. All right. Now, I do think one really big example was when Rome was destroyed. Rome as we knew it. It was destroyed by Christian barbarians. Alright. People who have been indoctrinated into an alternate form of faith than the Christians who lived inside of Rome. Which has its own issues because Christians inside Rome some strange reason believe that they're just supposed to sit around and pray about stuff 
There's nothing in the Bible that says that. I mean, you actually read the Bible, you know what's in the Bible. Man, there are all kinds of examples of Christians throwing down. Or actually, I should say Hebrews throwing down. Because there isn't actually anything in the Bible that I know of that are actual Christians. Christianity as a faith, as a movement, started because of the works in the Bible. To a degree. If you believe history. Or if you believe the biblical portion of the that's kind of convoluted subject to get into anyway. The idea, though, was that they wanted to sit around and pray about it, giving excuse to the idea that they wanted somebody else to solve the problem. Let's forget the fact that at one point that the... Uh, well, some of the most powerful people in the world are members of the church. To a degree, they still are. Anyway, let's just move aside from that topic. That will become a rabbit hole pretty soon. My point is that I am so damn frustrated with people that come out of the woodwork trying to tell me that I'm living my life wrong. And I need to do this. And I need to do that. Well, Self-reflection shows me that I am, to some degree, not living up to my potential. My day-to-day -day systems of interactment are not lending themselves to a successful life. That's fairly true. But none of that has anything to do with believing that somebody came down from heaven 2,000 years ago and put themselves on a cross to save me from being alive. So, let's start with that. Okay. Jesus, as depicted in the Bible, is depicted as so set apart from mankind, so removed, that he is... No longer by the end of the you know the whole act, he is no longer the son of God and the son of man. Because he was supposed to be bridging two worlds. He's just the son of God. Okay. As if mentioning in the same breath that he is son of man somehow makes him less. That was that was supposed to be the point. Not sure how many people lost that perspective. But the idea that this person did no wrong at all and ascended up on Calvary and was crucified for me breathing so I could breathe without feeling ashamed of myself. It's so ludicrous. It defies all logic. Okay? This person has nothing to do with me. Except for the fact that he was maybe, maybe not trained as a carpenter. You know, that's a whole, a whole argument built around whether or not Jesus trained under his father Joseph, his human father, to be a carpenter. Because typically you would have been taught the trade of your parents or your parent, you know, your male parent. Which on the outside looking in can also get kind of convoluted because the Jewish had a patriarchy and a, uh, um, what is the other, anyway, they, they followed the genealogy of their women and their men. Was that important to them? Anyway, Jesus would have been trained as a carpenter. At that point, that is the only mark of comparability between me and that person. The rest of their life, well, we know of it, because there isn't actually a lot written about Jesus' life, just his actions and deeds, as if they're set above us on a pedestal that we can only look up to but never reach. 
In fact, that is touted over and over and over again. That this is an example that we aspire to. But while we are alive, we can never do that because by the simple act of being born, we are the most vile, wretched creatures ever to walk the face of the earth. There can't possibly be anything wrong with the psychology behind this message. But then again, it does depend on which version of the Bible you read. I myself have always had a long conviction that there has to be something very wrong with the idea of someone putting their name on a holy book. Okay, some of y'all just don't understand what the hell I'm talking about. I'm talking about King James. They're not just King James on the cover of the Bible. He is in the title of the Bible, all right, and listed before the word of Bible. So it's the King James version of the Bible, not the Bible according to King James. Those of y'all who like playing with words, you should immediately grasp the significance of that. But that's a topic for another time. So, I feel like if Christians want to spend so much time telling each other how to live their damn lives, how everybody else how to live their damn life, they should go around policing up other Christians first. Because every time somebody runs up to me telling me, oh, oh, this, that, and the third, and I've got the perfect recipe for living a, a good life, which they're not telling you that. They're telling you this is what you got to do so that you can die and go to heaven and have eternal life. Well, it's just like this whole disconnect that, oh, you, you do realize you just told me I have to die to find all this out. Unless the rapture comes, which we're just going to be snatched out of our bodies and go instantly to heaven, or our bodies are going to vanish, which also doesn't make any damn sense. There's something psychologically wrong with this whole argument. And from that, I'm going to segue, very, very, very subtle segue into Mormonism. The Mormons. Now, I'm not going to talk about how other people see Mormons. It's kind of pointless. Those are only opinions. No, I'm going to talk about my first-hand observations of Mormons. Because when I lived in Alaska, I had a friend who was a Mormon. And I was invited to go to his church. And uh, because of my age, I was in the young adult class. And the way this was explained to me, it's like, like other churches, they're broken up into different classes and stuff. All right, that's, that's fine. And they go, but as far as I can understand, as far as the way it was set up when I went, they rotate different locations as to where you meet up. And when you do meet up, as for my assault, we had the young adults there with like anywhere from two to four uh, older people, usually couples, I guess. I didn't really get into the details of that so much because I only went four times. Um, maybe five. Uh, they're there to keep an eye on things. But pretty much everything is just the, the young adults. And they're immediately grouped together and separated. Alright, and so we do a little Sunday portion where they each take turns telling stories either out of the Bible or from their lives and relating it back to Christianity and Mormonism to a degree. And when, when you get done, you go into the, the worship hall. I don't know if it's the main worship hall. I not spend a lot of time exploring that building, uh, the first building I was in. And they... Oh, what do you call this? Well, you give a self-assessment of your life, basically. Each person goes up there and tells about their life. 
uh, what it was like before they became Christian, why they became Christian, how much better their lives are now after they become Christian. And I remember thinking very cynically, you know, this is a really good way to recruit people into church by grouping them in different age groups. All right. So it's almost impossible not to make some type of social ties. And those social ties will keep bringing me back to the church. All right. Plus, the Mormons themselves, I'm not attacking them, they're really friendly people from what I can tell, it's especially that youth group. They're very opening and welcoming, you know, and kind of a cheerful person, disposition and personality. Well, the problems started later on. Uh, was it later on? I gotta remember this timeline. You gotta remember this was. This has been. God, almost 10 years ago. Uh, the problem started when I told my buddy I would like to talk to some of the Mormon missionaries. Because I wanted to see what their recruitment message was. Right? And so. It's set up that we would fix dinner and they would come by and proselyte and give their recruitment message. And it was two young ladies who came. Not uncommon. Uh, and one of them happened to be, you know, a little attractive. Which doesn't hurt. You're trying to recruit some young men to the church. Send some attractive women out. Pull on their heartstrings, or maybe it was just completely random. Who knows? But one girl kind of took the lead and was explaining basically their faith. And at first, I was really jovial about it. You know, it sounds really good. And then at a certain point, it just kind of went straight downhill. Oh. And I was like, Oh my god. It was just absolutely awful. You know, so that was about the time when they started talking about spirit children. See, the outside looking in, we're basically told, for the most part, what the Mormons believe is your works on earth basically equate to your works in heaven, or your rewards in heaven. And break it down in the simplest terms, they believe that men will be equated to basically minor deities when they die. And if they were, their works were strong enough, you know, prominent enough, they would give me their own planets to rule over and their own celestial wives. And what this girl was explaining to me was that women, what do women get out of this? Cause that was another curiosity I had. What do women get out of this whole deal? Oh, women get spirit children. They get married to these these deities when they die. And they give birth to spirit children. So, my understanding of this, once you kind of uh, sift out all the poetic euphemisms and everything else is basically the women are nothing more than brood mares and this is make me angry it's made me sad you know that if this is what they all teach that this is this is what those women strive for in their faith what they're rewarded with in their faith is to be brood mares for the men after they die if you believe in that at all. I can't imagine otherwise intelligent people believing this garbage. Because from first to last, once you sift out all the poetic bullshit, it's a faith I've attributed entirely to men. It's literally a young man's fantasy. Now, maybe I'm wrong about this stuff. 
what I'm relating to you is a personal experience I had in a conversation with the missionaries of the Mormon Church. Okay? These are people I actually talked to in person. Now, sadly, we didn't get to the magic underwear. But I already knew from going to their church that there was the ceiling in the temple where they believe if you're true Mormons after you get married, you got to go to Salt Lake City and be sealed. Uh, basically, your souls are sealed together so you can find each other in the afterlife. That's true. That's 100% true. That's part of their document. Unless they've changed it recently. And so again, so here I am sitting here thinking about this. So the man, he accomplishes all these great things and he becomes, you know, a god, basically. And now he gets to keep his lifelong broodmare into the afterlife. Now, I'm not going to, not going to, you know, lie about it. I mean... Yeah, a small part of me said, man, this sounds really good. This sounds really awesome. I get to I get to find me a nice girl who's basically been taught to believe that I am the sole function in her life is to make me happy and make me awesome, you know. And when I die, I get even more of these. But that was never never something I was really attracted to because the very next step is to think, you know, I'm going to spend the rest of my life with this person because I'm a settle down and marry kind of guy. The most abhorrent thing I could think of is being stuck in a house with someone who has nothing to talk about. Now, there's no way in hell I wanted to be stuck conversating about that for all of eternity. I can't think of anything more fucking boring. And yes, that makes me kind of the center of the argument and very arrogant, but that's that's the thing. If I'm looking for a soulmate, I want somebody I can talk to, not somebody I agree with. But that, you know, I want somebody interesting, somebody who's still curious about life, you know. I'm a person with a lot of ideas, so maybe I'm looking for a news or a sounding board. But basically, that's what went through my mind when this, this young lady was talking about spirit children. And I was like, no, that's, that was kind of the final straw for me. That's where the conversation broke down. I just kept coming back to that. I was a lot younger then. Made me, made me, you know, give me a chance 10 years later. Actually, it's been 10 years now. Uh, give me a chance, I might handle that situation a little bit better. Maybe, you know, conversated with them a little bit more and at least listened to the entire message and not been such a colossal dick about it. <sighs> But that's not what happened. That was a colossal fucking dick about it. I wasn't angry and shouting at them, but I was just like, spirit children? Really? That... Spirit children? You have spirit children. That's what the conversation broke down to. And finally she got the hand, packed up her stuff, and said, well, you know, she was a lot more graceful about it than I was. That. But that that's Mormonism, and that was my first hand experience with Mormonism. Now, if you want to read some great fiction about you know well of, of people who portray Mormonism, Mormons is fairly fucked up and evil people. I mean, this has been a long time ago, but uh, for a time period of written about Zan Gray is an interesting one. Which, I can't remember if that's a pen name or not, but Zan Gray writes about the early Mormon church related in, in, in the westerns and how they would gather groups of men together and they would raid towns take off the So, 
That's a that's an interesting way to look at the early Mormon church, which my buddy did uh, tell me after doing some research because he had never heard of that. He did say that yeah, while that was true, what that stemmed from was the fact that the Old West, most part in the Old West, was you know Mormon church found in Salt Lake City, so the West. Um, Um, women were not allowed to own land. And, you know, the, the common play of the day, basically, was that you would get married young. That was kids as possible. So, you know, they could take care of the land. It's also the idea that, you know, it wasn't very common for kids to live very long. All the stuff that happened in the Old West. Diseases, snakes, Indian raids. Not that all Indians are bad, mind you, but I'm just saying this. There's just a whole bunch of shit that went on, all right? So they wanted to be ensured that the land would be passed on, their name would be passed on, all that other stuff, right? Well, that's all fine and dandy, but what would happen, though, is when these men would die, and let's say they had eight daughters and one son, and the son was like five years old, well... The bank was coming around claiming all this land. All right, and kicking these people out in the streets. And what the Mormons did, so they wrote in the clause that those in the church were of, uh, uh, they say, high enough in the church, or well enough off that they could afford to take care of another family, would be allowed to marry these women until the men, the boys, came of age and could inherit, inherit the land. And then what this eventually evolved into <laughs> was basically a winner take all mentality you know because if you combine that with the Mormons faith that men are rewarded for their their deeds on earth uh, basically their wealth and prosperity then obviously they're they're, <laughs> they're going to take everything they can get and so that's where that kind of came from but again, if I'm wrong, please let me know in the comments below. And all of you have a nice day.